Hey, how's it going everybody? It's Timothy here with Jank Diver Gaming, and this will be our final match in the Roto Cube. Um, we're against Lucas Reptar, attorney from below, lots of different names, man with many faces. And I have to apologize ahead of time because we actually already played our match. I won the match, doesn't really matter, but we didn't catch it on camera. And I felt really bad about that because we had such a sweet match and there were some really cool interactions from Lucas's deck. So this is kind of a consolation match just for Lucas to be able to show off his deck. I'm not going to go any easier or lighter on him, um, but he's got a really flashy deck, which we're going to check out here. And then we'll have Lucas come back and talk about it afterwards. But again, apologies. Uh, we had really awesome matches when we actually played and I just forgot to record the footage. Uh, so I lost it there, but you can kind of see his deck. He has gone on record for saying that his deck is a little bit of a mess and he doesn't have the proper mana fix in to make it tick. You can see a lot of double white, a lot of double black. There's even double blue. And then there's like Valkyan here too, which costs the red mana and means he has to play this Canyon slew. Um, so it's a little bit of a hodgepodge, but it does powerful things. You can see there's like aggressive cards here and then there's just game winners here and there's a bunch of stuff in the middle. Uh, he did funnily enough take a lot of interesting cards from me during the draft valky rise of the dreadmarn are cards that i wanted for my deck but they ended up going into lucas's pool and that's one of the nuances of uh uh roto drafting is you never know what cards the other people are going to pick up and you get to see it disappear so <laughs> it's a little bit weird um his deck was pretty well positioned against mine i can have some fast starts against him but once he gets to this stage of the game right here he can stabilize with cards like um the uh luminous brood moth and he has like elspeth conquers death to take out some of my more uh useful cards and things of that so he's got interaction of every sort i think he mulliganed here and i'm on the draw um and i've got a decent hand here immersturm predator is powerful against him we've seen this card be kind of like critical against a lot of my opponents, but he does have ways to deal with it. He has um, Burrell's expertise. He has ways to bounce it for one, but he's also got the um, uh, Elspeth Conquer's death. And I want to say he has Skyclave Apparition too, which is a very important card. And he's going to start off with Usher of the Fallen, which is actually a really powerful card against, or in his deck. Um, he mulled him to six and starting off with the one drops pretty nice for him. I'm going to start off with Gutter Bones with the intention to block the Usher next turn. And we'll see what happens there. I don't have a particularly fast start. I need to draw maybe something else to interact. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised to just see Usher pump out a token here. And that is exactly what it does. Chandra is not great here. Um, I could just fetch up a Plains here in case I draw a white card. Uh, seems like it could be important. Not playing anything this turn is a little wonky though. I could also just get the Blood Crypt tapped. I think it's okay to play the Fabled Passage and just go get my planes. Um, yeah, if I draw like a Cruel Celebrant or something, I just don't have another meaningful play, so I'm going to go get a planes with this. It thins out the deck a little bit as well. I do need double red for Chandra, so this, this might have been just like absolutely terrible play. Because now if I don't draw anything worth casting, like a white spell, I can't even play this Chandra. I should have just played Blood Crypt. The fact that I know I can cast this next turn and I'm not necessarily drawing a white card the turn after, plus I, that Fable Passage can still just go get a Plains the following turn, that was really bad. All right, Valky's going to take a look at my hand. He's going to take this Immersturm Predator for sure. And if that ever becomes an Immersturm Predator, it's going to be a problem. But it does look like he might be missing lands. That 1-1 one, one can get in. Oh, yeah, if this just becomes Immerster and Predator, the game might be over. I do have Kaya for it, though, which he knows about. Uh, I'm going to take my one. And drawing something to add to the board would be nice. A creature that can't block, however, is not great. So we're going to play it. Could play Blood Crypt and pass the turn. He's missing blue mana currently. Any fourth untapped land means that Valky can become a Immerster and Predator, which is quite powerful. Eats my graveyard a little bit as well. But we'll see what he has. I would have played Chandra this turn for sure if uh, I just had a 3-drop. Given that the Scrap Heap Scrounger can't even block. Alright, we've got 4 mana. Is Valky just going to become a Predator? It is a Predator. Very nice. Nothing in Graveyard to eat yet. 
but Predator is going to push in a lot of damage before I can get Kaya down. Not to mention I still have to draw my fifth land before I can even uh, do anything with Kaya. That happens. All right, Blood Artist is a card that exists. I'm definitely going to tap with Scrounger, or attack with Scrounger, rather. Um, I don't really see a compelling reason not to. Uh, if he eats it out of the graveyard, that's okay. Like, he would have to trade with the Usher here to do that. I suppose I could attack with both. I'm going to take five next turn, and I need to draw an untapped source to be able to Kaya it. Uh, Chandra would be so much better to have on board. Chandra would be dead, though. He would just attack it with the uh, creature. Let's go ahead and play Blood Ars and attack with Scrap Heap Scrounger. I guess I could attack with both, but he's just winning the race. There's no reason to do that. I'm only really attacking here because the Scrounger can't block, right? Okay, I like this. It does set him up to be able to use the Predator and, you know, exile a creature out of my graveyard. But the Blood Artist triggers matter, and getting his creature off board is not irrelevant either. Let's see what else he's got going on here. All right, so I'm going to take five, and Scrappy's going to get exiled. I think I could block here. I think I'm going to block this. He's more likely to just play a creature that can attack. I don't... My creatures getting exiled doesn't matter that much here. Interesting. Interesting that he wouldn't just let Gutter Bones trade. Can this... Only deer in your turn, so I wouldn't even be able to do that. Okay, Wrath of God makes sense. So he's kind of banking on me not drawing a fifth land. I did not draw a fifth land. I did, however, draw Call of the Death Dweller, which is pretty good. Get my both my creatures back out of my graveyard. Predator's still coming in hot and heavy, though. Alright, so we want to give this... Hey, we just put both counters on Gutter Bones. Notably, he missed his fifth land. He's missing blue mana. It might not matter. This attacks for six and then seven. Thalia. Ugh, Thalia turns uh, Kaya off by a turn. Which is extremely relevant. Judith's not going to do it. So I need to play Chandra here. Because Chandra... Oh, and I don't have the land for next turn either. Yikes. I don't actually have a choice. Um, I can't play Kaya next turn either, which I think means that this game's probably over. So we'll make some tokens. Attack with... One, two, three. I'm going to go up to nine life here. And then he can attack with both. I have to chump here with Blood Artist. So I think I keep Gutter Bones on defense. Maybe not. Maybe I'd chump with Blood Artist. Alright, so I think we both got a little bit screwed. I don't know what he's holding in hand. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a number of cards he just can't cast. But Thalia actually makes it so that I'm probably going to lose this game here. The fact that now I can't play Kai even if I do draw an untapped land. It's pretty gross. Skyclave Apparition, and that's GG. Alright, the Valky was very good there. Um, obviously, drawing a fifth land would have completely changed that game. But we did not draw the fifth land. Here, so let's look at his sideboard because I remember there being relevant cards. And this is where we have, like, a tiny little bit of information. Last time, what did he bring in against us? We know Yeheni's expertise is probably coming in. Um, Maul of the Skyclave. I don't think he brought in that much against me last time. But against him, he has Wraths and Interactions, stuff like that. Uh, I think this was a matchup where I wanted Coco. Untethered Express also is pretty good against a lot of his stuff. Uh, granted, you know, Elspeth Conquers Death and 
Skyclave Apparition can deal with it, but Wrath of God can't, Ravenous Chupacabra can't, can't be uh, picked up by King Narfi or Scarab God, stuff like that. So it can get ahead of the game. It's bad against Thalia specifically, but I can't really play a lot thinking that he's going to have Thalia every single time. Uh, Dreadhorde Invasion is pretty good against him. Just, uh, you know, he's not going to be pressuring my life total a huge amount. Command the Dreadhorde is also likely decent. Here, Corvold was a little bit problematic. Playing Corvold, sacking something that I don't necessarily want to sack, and then getting this bounce with, like, Brawl's Expertise or Wrath or Elspeth Conqueror's Death is just really bad. Legion War Boss, decent against everything but the Wrath. And I think Coco's decent here, too. So, um... As far as things to cut, Village Rites is a card that I've been cutting pretty much every single game. Call of the Death Dweller and Blood for Bones have looked pretty bad. And I wish I had remembered how I had uh, sideboarded against him last time. I might take out the Call of the Death Dweller and just go super high on creatures, which is a tried and true strategy here. But I think this is what we're looking at right now. Um, kind of the same game plan, really. Not too much different. Command the Dread Horde is interesting to me because he does have good ETB value creatures, but I need to be able to kill them, which is not something I do very well. So let's go ahead and swing it back for a game two and see what happens. That Just losing to Valky is so punishing. <laughs> losing to a card that you wanted in your pool. Play first. We've got a lot of colors. We've got a really nice curve out here too. So Swamp into Summit into Vantage. We've got all four colors, and we've got a 1, 2, 3 curve out. So I'm definitely keeping this. It's good against a lot of his creature draws. It's pretty bad against uh, a Wrath or anything along those lines, but at least the Lost Rider can come back. The Dread Wanderer can come back later in the game. It's not bad. It is not bad. Glass Pool Mimic. Uh, Croaks is a nice one to have for a later turn with the Priest of Forgotten Gods. But for this turn, I think we're going to go ahead and drop our Dragon Skull Summit. Just get a lot of black mana out there. Attack for two. Maybe the Inspire Advantage. I guess it doesn't really matter. Let's get this down so we don't forget about it. Let's see what he has that he can even interact with on two. He has an Eliminate in his deck. Giant Killer's three mana. Not a lot. It's really just Eliminate that we're going to see here if he has a way to kill a creature. Looks like he foretold a card, which we should check that out as well. Uh, foretell cards. What do you got? He's got Rise of the Dreadmarn. Uh, he has the, the Glorious Protector in his sideboard, and I think that's it. He has Behold the Multiverse. So right now, oh, he has, um, no, no, no. Uh, Liam was the one with the Doomscar. So this could be a lot of different things. We don't really have a lot of information to go on. If he passes next turn with three mana up, we got to watch out for Glorious Protector. But this turn, I think, is pretty obvious. Just Low Strider Pass. And I think I'm going to attack with the Priest. Does the one extra damage matter that much? It kind of does in a deck like this. I could keep up Low Strider just to be able to activate it in case he drops a creature next turn. Like, if he goes for Redain or something, this kind of puts him off being able to cast a good creature. So I think we're going to play Low Strider, attack for two, and just leave the Priest active here. One extra point of damage could matter a lot. Okay, all three colors. So this is looking a lot like Glorious Protector to me. Uh, Behold the Multiverse would have probably just been cast. All right, this is pretty good. So I can go Skeleton... And then have these two active for the priest and just attack with these. And there's not too much else he could do there. And I'm going to play Fabled Passage and go for Croaks of this turn as well. Let's play that first. I don't need to get a green here. I have double red, I have double black. Probably just going to go get another mountain because I have triple black. And we're going to attack with these two. Looks like attack goes through. Should I go for Kroxa plus Priest here? 
I think I like just holding Priest up. I'm still going to play Croaks, though. So I need to get red or black here. Guess I'll get red, like I said. And we will just cast Croaksa. I'm just going to let it die. I'm not going to go for the, uh, the Priest here. Alright, he took three there. That's a pretty big deal. He's at virtual six with the Priest of Forgotten Gods on board. Hmm. It's definitely not Behold the Multiverse. It doesn't feel like Rise of the Dreadmarn. Yeheni's Expertise. So that's going to kill my board, but I get to do some stuff. So I go Priest, Sack, Sack. That leaves me the mana to bring back the Skeleton. Woe Strider can Sack the Priest for value as well. He's also going to free roll a spell into play. Um, let's go ahead and scry first. Angrath's Rampage. Do we feel like that's just a good top deck? I'm going to have one, two, three, four creatures in my graveyard. I could leave this in the graveyard as well. Angrath's Rampage. Not enough mana to do that. I'm going to draw this off the Priest. I think this is probably good in case he does just drop like a Scarab God or something like that. Uh, it seems worth enough to keep on top. Maybe not. I don't know. That's a tough call. Yeah, bottom C is okay. All right, let's go ahead and Priest. Sack these two. So he's going to go down to four here. I guess I misjudged the amount of mana. Um, and then this is going to sack the priest, and I'll bring back the reassembling skeleton after the Yeheni's expertise is resolved. So resolve that, and then before phases change, let's see what he casts here. King Narfi's Betrayal. That mills me. Oh, but he's going to take the Kroxa. So we saw this actually before as well. So that mills me. It puts creatures in my graveyard. And he gets to pick one of his as well. But he has to... I think he kind of just has to take Kroxa. Which he can cast Kroxa, it'll go back to my graveyard, which is bad for him too. But he's just going to leave it exiled. And the fact that that didn't put a creature on board matters quite a bit. Judith's strong here as well. So I'm going to shock here. And then I'm going to play Judith attack for two and just play Scrounger, I think. That way, if he has a Wrath as his way out of this... What did he exile of his own? He exiled Yorion, which isn't going to get it done. Down to two, and I'll play just another recursive creature. Putting Gutter Bones in my hand seems worse. Alright, here's a bunch of bodies. He can cast Croaks of this turn, which doesn't accomplish very much. A Wrath doesn't do it, because he'll die to Judith. And I'm pretty sure that card is Glorious Protector. The Foretold card. Okay, we got him there. We had a pretty good start that game, though. Even through a Wrath, it feels pretty nice. Um, King Narfi's Betrayal doesn't change very much. Obviously, we knew Yeheni's Expertise was going to come in. I believe... Let's go back real quick. Because I believe you're allowed to see your opponent's Foretold cards. Yeah, Glorious Protector. Uh, nice little tip for anyone who's playing. I don't know if I mentioned this in a previous video, but there's a rule with Fortell that you have to reveal all your foretold cards at the end of a game. So if a game ends and you're going into a sideboard match, you can go check out your opponent's exile pile and it'll show you what they had foretold. So the Glorious Protector was indeed the card. And we managed to play around that one fine. Um, I don't think I'm going to change anything else on the play here. Village Rites could be a good answer to specifically um, Elspeth Conquers Death and the Skyclave Apparition. Because those are cards that uh, can exile my creatures, and I don't really want my creatures exiled. But I think I'm just going to run with what I got here and hope for a similar hand. Command the Dreadhorde's a nice card to have against Narfi's Betrayal. Also, if he's just going to wipe my board, being able to use Command the Dreadhorde to get my board back seems mm -hmm. decent question is is there a strong cut or a card that i feel strongly about cutting here dread horde invasion could be pretty poor on the draw especially this card doesn't really get going for a little while okay let's just have a game finisher that's good against some of the incidental mill that's going to happen here and uh we'll wish lucas a good game three 
No Valkyries, no Sweepers, no Exile, please. <laughs> Alright, what do we got? No white mana, but we do have Scrounger into one of these creatures, which is a pretty good start, and if I draw white mana later on, that's fine. I don't necessarily need to play Hidden Stockpile right now. So we've got Tomb into Summit as a pretty good start. I think making uh, drawing a Gutter Bones or a Dread Wanderer would make this hand close to ideal. Lucas took a Mulligan as well. We'll see what happens. Looks like maybe a little bit of a risker or a tough uh, mulligan decision. We got a Plains into Usher. Usher would put on some pressure. Giant Killer. Just cast in Giant Killer. Okay. Uh, Giant Killer is going to get in a little bit of damage. No black mana as of note. And there's my white mana for later on down the line. For now, we're just going to put some uh, power on board. Some people do forget that Scrounger can't block as well. I think Lucas knows that quite well. But uh, some people do forget that and just won't attack into it or, you know, keep back. I don't, I don't know. They, they won't attack into it sometimes. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, maybe he's going to tap it. Is this two mana to tap? All right. Let's see if that's what happens. Makes sense. There's no reason to get in a point of damage. Um, I could have played Chandra this turn now that I think about it. I still think I'm going to go ahead and play Woe Strider. Maybe. And Judith seems like a better follow-up to Woe Strider than vice versa. And I might just play Chandra next turn. I could also play Judith into Chandra next turn. But I kind of like getting the Sack Alloy down. And we don't quite have Immersturm Predator next turn because Terramorphic doesn't let me cast that. But it would be nice Wrath Protection. All right. Let's see. Valkamira, that card's so good. So if I deal damage to him, he takes one less damage. And if I deal damage to any of his permanents, everything just takes one less damage. Plus targeting him or his uh, permanents costs one additional mana. Now, one thing to note is that um, some of the uh, effects, like Blood Artist, uh, cause your opponent to lose life, so this doesn't affect them, but it does affect Judith. Judith now basically does nothing when it dies, or when creatures die. Perforos's Intervention could get rid of this, and I could attack for four. Alternatively, I think I just like going Judith here. The Chandra is actually shut off pretty much. This shuts Chandra off pretty nicely. So let's go Terramorphic. And we're going to go Judith just because it pushes in more damage with these other creatures. But it is kind of awkward if he wipes the board. Then Judith does basically nothing. <laughs> which is kind of funny. Save this for a big creature. Alright, well Judith does push in more damage this turn. So this is 6 damage essentially. Valkmir is really good against my deck. It doesn't actually stop most of my Blood Artist effects because they're not damaged, but it does stop the one that I have, and that matters. It doesn't look like we have black mana in hand either, and given that Lucas's deck has a lot of double black cards in it, that's probably not good. But yeah, Judith versus Valkmira. And you can see here just the, the shield half of this card being like so significantly better than the, the front half. It was the front half, I'd just kill it. <laughs> uh, but it's not. Alright, we got a Scry 2 on Charming Prince. That means we're looking for lands, I believe. Specifically black sources. Two to the top is scary. Charming Prince can just block Judith now as well. Gutter Bones. Not very good. Oh, I didn't crack my Terramorphic. I'm such an idiot. <laughs> I'm such a moron. Because um, I would just play Immersturm Predator. Now I'm definitely going to play Chandra, which is still okay. It doesn't actually do anything. You just ignore it. So I'm going to zero and put a counter on it. I guess I could zero and sack the tokens to just scry to some action. I wonder if I'd rather do that or just put an additional counter on the Chandra. I guess I can attack with these, make him tap down stuff. 
tap down scrap heap scrounger because you want me to trade off low strider i believe is the the right call that it is and do i attack do i trade low strider for charming prince here is the question it doesn't get any damage in on him it does get a blocker out of the way which matters quite a bit It also means Chandra's just going to be under less pressure. Could attack with this random goat. It doesn't actually do any damage. If I attack with Judith, he just blocks here and takes three. So the question is whether or not I want to trade Woe Strider for Charm and Prince, and I kind of don't want to, although I do kind of want to get Charm and Prince out of the way. It's a really interesting question. Not playing Predator here seems like a bad idea. <laughs> seems like not a good idea, and he kept two cards on top. Um... I think Woe Strider might be a little more important. I'm going to go ahead and play Chandra, and I'm just going to scry a couple times. These wouldn't trigger Judith anyway. Oh, these are two ones. Oh, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> I'm playing this extremely poorly. Bastion's good, so... Yeah, Bastion is a good draw. I'm going to take that. I'm a little starved on mana, and I missed out on some damage, and I'm playing very poorly, but all that being said, wow, Canyon Slew tapped. Deputy of Detention, it's going to take Woe Strider, right? Taking Judith. I could sack Judith. I think I'd rather just keep it on board, though. See if anything comes at Chandra? No. All right. So, I could go Predator, I could go Bastion and Gutter Bones. I could just kill this. Right now, Deputy of Detention can actually just attack Scrap Heap Scrounger. Or, I'm sorry, block Scrap Heap Scrounger. I think I'm just going to play this Predator. And the Canyon Slew leads me to believe that either he very desperately needs Black Mana, or he has Valky in hand. And he's going for the Domri. Domri? What's it called? Tibble. Tibble. Bastion seems really good though. Bastion into gutter bones and just start draining him out and ignore Valkmira. Predator kind of forces him to do something too. I think I can go Predator this turn. And then I can go make these two things. I could just tap one right now. And then make this five power next turn. I don't have to exile a card to do that. Uh, I have no blockers if that's the case, but that's probably fine. They're not going to kill Chandra. So yeah, I'm going to do that just to put a counter on the Predator. I will not submit. And then this will sack that. Spire Advantage comes in tapped. I think I'll pass on a tap land. Okay, no attacks. Scrap Heap Scrounger cannot get through Deputy. I don't want to trade off Woe Strider on this board. Gideon of the Trials. Nice. So that's going to blank Immersturm Predator? Show me what you can do. I assume. Yeah. Alright, so Immersturm Predator can't deal damage next turn. Into a Foretold card, which... We have not a lot of information about that. Plus, no land drop this turn. Okay, Gideon. Angrass Rampage, that can get rid of this. I can make him sack an artifact. And then... I could deal two damage to something. That's not great. I almost, since I'm not attacking this turn anyway, I almost want to just get bastion down and start going ham on the the bastion triggers because if i'm not dealing damage to him anyway i don't need to prioritize getting rid of valkmira right so what i'm gonna do is play bastion make some tokens no point in attacking with predator
Plague Crafter. That's not very good here. I, I want to hit more lanes. I do want to be able to double spell. Um, sack the other one. Fabled Passage I will keep. And then we're going to play Gutter Bones and pass the turn. Okay. There is some stuff happening here. Got to watch out for this card. Yep, Gideon's walling up my Predator, as expected. I guess I should have sacked one just to make this bigger. Behold the Multiverse. Okay, good. Bolt's really strong here. I think he needs to find an answer for Bastion more than anything else at the moment. Eliminate Chandra. That's pretty good. None of these can sack Planeswalkers. Yeah, Chandra is my persistent form of uh, damage. Life loss, if you will. And we're going to draw the Fabled Passage. Okay, so I'm going to Fabled Passage into Hidden Stockpile. Um, I guess I could just attack with Scrap Heap or Gutter Bones. I mean, I can just sack, put this back in my hand, play it, and Fabled Passage. Do I have enough black mana for that? I need three black mana. This is three, four, five. All right, so this is going to go get Swamp. We're just going to try to bleed him out here. I could Angress Rampage, but I don't have a good attack. Really? I kind of do. I can make him use the Giant Killer. Let's see if he actually does that. Okay, that is fair. Now, I might as well just attack with Gutter Bones dies regardless here and if he lets the one damage through then sure okay gutter bones will die here i'm actually just gonna sack it to the predator put a uh, is scrying scrying's better right scrying's just better Forest can go to bottom. Right now, I'm just really digging for more Blood Artist effects. Alright, so that's in combat. Let's go ahead and get Gutter Bones back. Let's play Gutter Butt. And let's play Stockpile, which can start pumping out more tokens to sacrifice to the Bastion here. So, looking okay. Right now, on board, I could sack 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6. Seven creatures? I can sack six creatures to uh, Bastion, because one of these has to be left. And at some point, he might be able to Gideon Emblem to make it so that I can't drain him out. Hanged Executioner is a good one. But I'm trying to hold on to Angress Rampage so I can make him sack the Gideon in case that happens. Uh, what would he get rid of? He would get rid of Woe Strider? I don't know my top card. I'm going to sack this token. He can't activate Hanged Executioner right now, though. Doesn't have the fourth mana. Yeheni. I think Yeheni can go to bottom. I'm okay on sack outlets. Swamp. Okay. I see your swamp. Um, I think same deal. Could also just kill Gideon with this, right? It's at six, so I would need to do it for four because of Valkmira. I wonder, I mean, I wonder if there's like actual merit here to just making him sack the artifact, killing Gideon, and working with what I've got on board here. I'm going to play this. Because Gideon not being able to do this forces him to use the Hang Executioner here. Get rid of Valkmira matters quite a bit. I wonder if there's just as much merit to getting rid of Valkmira and then killing this with Perforos' intervention and getting my Judith back and just trying to shoot him down real quick. Do I have enough to do that? Probably not. It's kind of a tough call. Um, at any rate... 
I don't think I'm doing anything yet. We'll go to combat. Make him use his mana up. Gutter Bones. Bastion Trigger. Kuros Celebrant's exactly what I want. That is the card that I want. I don't have a way to draw it right now, though. Um, no real reason to attack. And I don't see a real reason to Angrath's Rampage yet, either. So we'll just get Gutter Bones back and replay it. And then get a Servo on the end step. Cruel Celebrant should just about wrap things up. I guess if he has um, Tibble, 7 mana Tibble here, and it exiles the top card of my library, it can nag the Cruel Celebrant. But I actually wouldn't be surprised if Gideon makes an emblem here. <laughs> there it goes. All right, we got a Gideon emblem, which means Gideon does have to be off the board for me to win. But I have kept Angress Rampage, and I have Perforos' Intervention as uh, ways to deal with that. Yorion. All right, Yorion's going to get some value here. I wonder if he's going to get rid of Deputy and try to get rid of something different. Yorian's definitely probably gaining three life with the Charmin Prince. Making a... Okay, Deputy. Interesting. So he wants to get rid of something else. Also note he did not prevent the damage from the Predator this fallen turn. Alright. Uh, you get some more value creatures. Nice. What's Deputy going to take? Probably Bastion at this point, right? Charmin Prince went Scry 2. Okay. Deputy, I think, is going to take Bastion here. Deputy is targeting... Uh, what is Deputy targeting? All right. Resolve Hanged Executioner. I can't tell what Deputy is targeting. Oh, Judith again. Sure. Okay. And we've got a Scry 2. So I think Celebrant's going to make this pretty easy, right? Celebrant plus Bastion is 2 life loss. And then this gets rid of it. Uh, the Gideon. I guess I should see if there's something he can interact with for 2 mana that I'm not really thinking about. Eliminates in the graveyard. I don't think there's anything he can do to um, stop me here. And he's probably going to use the mana on Giant Killer. So I'm going to go ahead and make him just do that first. Giant Killer, tap down Predator. Yes, that'll trigger. I'll just eat something. And I think we're probably good here. So Celebrant. And we will start sacking some dudes. So Celebrant has to be last, but this should do it. And it doesn't matter what actually gets scried here. Attack this. He's at one, and then sack this. And then rampage you, make you sack a creature, which actually does cost one more to cast. Uh, target player sacks a planeswalker. And that should do it. All right, good games, Lucas. Good games. Let's uh, let's go ahead and see if we can grab Lucas and bring him here to chat about his deck one more time. Hey, Lucas, you there? Yep. All right, we we actually recorded this time. <laughs> yeah, I think that might have been your only out, that and Kaya. Uh, yeah, the um, the Gideon emblem is uh kind of a problem. <laughs> I mean, that's what I was hoping for. Well, I had to, so I had Perforos' intervention in hand too, which could potentially deal with it. But uh, Valkmira makes. I, I didn't realize how good Valkmira was going to be until I saw Judith didn't do anything. <laughs> Honestly, I was sad when I realized that uh, both 
uh, Blood Artist and Bastion of Remembrance are worded, lose life, not deal damage. I was like, no, this card would be significantly better if it just stopped all of the damage I'm taking. Yeah, that would. I, I don't think I could win if that's what it did. So, I mean, I was holding Angress Rampage for a little while, the last couple turns there, and I was like, this can kill Valkyra or it can kill Gideon, and I'm not sure if I should fire it off. I, I think I can drain you out and then, like, just kill Gideon. Um,. But I, I don't know. It was it was a little uh yeah the the shield half of that card is so much better than the god half. <laughs> oh yeah, and matches I, like this. Yeah, I I didn't have a ton going on. I had Scarab God sitting in hand with nothing to do, and then I had Yehenny's expertise on top of my library just in case. But mm. yeah, I if you had a way to get rid of the Gideon, I didn't have a way to win the game. Right. Um. The it. it I think was it game one or game two? I don't remember, but uh, it's it's a little demeaning to lose to the Valky, turning into oh, the Predator. <laughs> I get, yeah, that was that was game one, and it was it was something. I so that game, I think I played correctly, but I also had to take a risk. So the turn where I wrapped the board, mm -hmm. I could have played the Thalia to make sure you couldn't play Kaya to exile the Valky. Right. But I told myself, if I clear the board now and he doesn't draw a land, I don't see a way I lose. And so I just had to risk you not drawing a land to play the Kaya. Yeah, I did I did not draw a land. <laughs> and then Thalia the next turn pretty much shored that up, that uh, the Predator was going to get in for the last points of damage. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, we've, we've already talked like between the two of us about the deck, uh, but viewers haven't seen it so if you if you had anything you want to say about your deck go for it uh just a reminder to people watching that like <laughs> uh lucas started off with uh elspeth conquers death and luminous broodmoth and then third picked scarab god in this draft which uh sent the whole table into a frenzy yeah so i i tried to do something and i've played this cube before so i know that the archetype isn't supported yet here i am trying to make etb value work and i just didn't get the fixing to get all of my colors I mean, there was a, I think my first hand that I mulliganed that last game had Chupacabra and zero black lands. And so I was like, well, this is a useless card that doesn't do anything. Right. Um, but I mean, the deck did some sweet things and it can do some sweet things. Uh, I wish they'd gotten to see our first games. But yeah, I, I mean, know. there's some, <laughs> I'm looking at my main board now and there's some cards that I should just not be playing. Like Rise of the, Rise of the Dreadmarn just isn't worth it. I'm not playing nearly enough of uh, wraths to make that card good um i think i should probably be main boarding deputy of detention even though it's a blue card but it can just get rid of things that i can't otherwise deal with but the deck has is doing enough different things where you can win a bunch of different ways i've won games where usher of the fallen just made tokens and beat my opponent to death and then i've won the more grindy controlly games where i wrath the board and then i just keep a threat on board so it does some cool stuff it's just not consistent enough to be good yeah it, it feels like if you draw like your colors perfectly then you're gonna have a really good like chance of winning and but it feels like it doesn't do that too often yeah no it's it's definitely rough at times i mean that there's like i said there's just not enough good fixing left i was fighting too many different people trying to do the same things that i was as far as the blue white and the blue black there was a player who was strictly blue black mm -hmm. someone just decided to go blue white way later than i think anyone had planned and so i thought that was going to be just fixing i could have and then it was gone yeah the fixing is fixing is a tricky scenario for these roto drafts it's like what like I, i'm not i'm still not sure when you're supposed to take it I mean, I first picked Fabled Passage and then took Blood Crypt like thir third pick, and I think that's way too early. But <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's it's kind of kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, thanks for the rematch again. Sorry that we didn't get to uh, display the first match, which had uh, probably some really uh, memorable, cool moments. Um, but these were good games too. So glad we got a, a rematch in there. Yep, good games, Tim. All right, good games. I'll catch you around. All right, everybody, that was Lucas uh, Rotor Reptar, sorry, uh, Reptar.
with our final Roto match uh, from the perspective of the Mardu Aristocrats deck. Again, really sweet deck from Lucas. A lot of value stuff going on in the top end, but not really the fix-in to justify a lot of it. Like, his deck could have, would have probably killed for Fabled Passage, which uh, I first picked in the Roto draft, so <laughs> uh, no um, way of getting that. Again, we were playing this one just for fun, so the record doesn't matter as much. Uh, this was just a rematch to make sure Lucas had uh, the time to display the things that his deck can do, and uh, his deck did a couple things, so um, that's going to do it. That wraps up all of our giraffes and we'll look at our deck one final time and i want to say thanks for anybody who's watching these uh, if you found this uh entertaining you want to see more of this sort of content let us know because we are probably going to be rolling roto drafts into the near future and uh, we're excited to try them out it's a really fun way to engage with a cube or a new set or something along those lines but again um this is what we played you've seen it nine different times now so you might be sick of it Things that worked out, things that didn't work out. The green splash for Corvold was bad. Um, not only was Corvold just actively not great, but the fact that I have these cards, specifically these double color pip cards at two, and then I have a couple here, means that drawing an actual forest, which happened a couple times, means I can't cast these on turn two a decent amount of the time, and that hurts quite a bit. Um, also, having to dedicate, like, when you draw your Fabled Passage, knowing that your Fabled Passage should get white, but that cuts you off uh, available green sources later in the game in case you draw Corvold seems pretty bad. I think the Collected Company would have been better in the main deck than the Corvold. So Corvold was pretty bad. The reanimation spells were also quite bad most of the time. Blood for Bones, just uh, th this needs to be getting back big creatures to really be super valuable. Um, and I don't have any, like... Blood for Bones is really good when you're getting back five drops and six drops and sacking your little creatures to get it back, but I'm sacking little creatures to get back other little creatures, and while there's some combo potential there, it's just not a very powerful effect. Call of the Death Dweller is a little bit better than Blood for Bones, but requires a little bit more setup, and uh, just these cards did not seem particularly good in this deck. Call of the Death Dweller is obviously very, very good with Judith, but I don't think we ever got to see that. Um... The shell of the deck was great. The Celebrants, uh, or the Blood Artist effects, we picked up all of them in the draft. So there's Cruel Celebrant, there's Judith, there's Bastion of Remembrance, and there's Blood Artist. And we just see, once you start combining these together, you win the game pretty quickly. So that's kind of the game plan. And then the Sacrifice Outlets with Immersturm Predator, Yeheni, and Woe Strider really pulled its weight. And the rest of the deck just, just kind of like augmenting this strategy. We saw everything at different points do something and uh, we lost to decks that went way faster than us or way over the top of us. But anything that got in a mid-range stall against us, we're going to break that stall because we have more recursion, more ways to use our mana, and we have a strategy that can get around not being able to attack. And uh, yeah, we played tons of games where we just didn't have to attack for the win, which is kind of nice. But Corvold, this will not be here um, very soon. We've already uh, planned on taking this card out, but if I could switch things up, I would probably drop these three cards. I would probably start Legion War Boss. I would probably start Dreadhorde Invasion. I would probably start like one of these or the Collected Company over Corvold, and my deck would look probably a little bit more like this. But in the spirit of transparency, when you're doing these Roto drafts, people tend to prefer that you keep your deck the same during the entire time. So once you've submitted your deck list, uh, you know, people are going to be going by your deck list submission to figure out what to play around and stuff like that. So you keep things the same. But anyway, I'm missing a card. Whatever, you get the point. This is closer to what my final deck would look like if I had a strong choice, maybe even the Stitcher Supplier in there. But that's going to do it. Um, this has been an awesome experience. We're going to be doing a little bit more of this. We'll probably shake up uh, how you engage with the content and how you see it. I understand a lot of people might not be interested in seeing the same deck nine times in a row, so we can figure out how to match people up against each other and record that for viewership. Uh, I think we would enjoy doing that. But um, you can let me know how you felt about this playlist and this uh, Roto drafting in the comments below. And if you want to try it out yourself and join the cube community and get into our next Roto Draft or just draft this deck on Wednesday nights, uh, 7.30 Eastern, then there will be uh, links in the description below this video. And on top of that, feel free to subscribe to the Jank Diver Gaming uh, channel for more content like this. 
we promise we'll be putting up more cube related content in the future so thanks for watching this has been awesome thanks for hanging out for the playlist and i hope everybody's enjoyed the games my name is timothy with jank diver gaming and we will catch you all next time